This is JSA TV, the newsroom for tech and telecom professionals. I'm Dean Perrine and welcome to JSA TV. Today we are talking FCC Spectrum Auction with industry observers from Vertex Consulting. With us in the virtual studio today we have Mr. Greg Weiner. Greg is the co-founder and partner at Vertex and Mr. Daniel Vitulich. Daniel is a principal consultant at Vertex. Guys, welcome to JSA TV. Thanks, Dean. All right. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, Greg, this one's for you. Why don't you tell our viewers quickly about Vertex Consulting and what this FCC Spectrum Auction business is all about. Exactly what does it mean to our industry? Sure, happy to. Thanks for uh, having us today. Um, so Vertex War is uh, a boutique consulting firm focused almost exclusively on the wireless space. Um, we, our customers are wireless carriers, the OEM, service providers, uh, even infrastructure owners like fiber and small cell and, and, and tower owners as well. Um, fairly broad array of services we provide, similar to most of uh, the larger management consulting firms. However, we focus, as I said, um, very narrowly on the, uh, on the wireless space and, and primarily have experts uh, who've worked in and around the industry for, for decades. Uh, with respect to the auction, um, you know, you're all familiar with uh, the 600 megahertz auction that's, that's underway with uh, the FCC right now. Uh, the, this auction is a bit different than ones of the auctions in the past. Uh, previously, a uh, set of spectrum was identified uh, and simply auctioned off to the wireless carriers who would then go through the steps to clear that spectrum uh, and reallocate those, uh, those existing users into to other spectrum bands or out of the, the space altogether. In this case, uh, the, the FCC has embarked on a fairly complex um, an ambitious mission to try and take spectrum that has an incumbent set of users, and, and namely the broadcast television providers, uh, and uh, identify through this uh, dual auction process, a reverse and a forward auction, a price that uh, the broadcasters would be willing to take to release their spectrum uh, and ma matching that with a price that the wireless carriers are, are willing to pay uh, to acquire that spectrum. It was born in, uh, out of, it's been, it's been in the works for a number of years. It was born out of the 2012 uh, Recovery and Reinvestment Act uh, and is just now finally underway uh, starting in the middle of 2016. Um, as I said, unlike past auctions, we're really looking at market forces to try and marry supply and demand. Um, the broadcasters are bidding against one another in what they call a reverse auction, where the price actually bids down over time. They're bidding against one another. Who's willing to take the least amount of money to free up their spectrum? Uh, once they achieve certain, certain benchmarks, it then flips over to a, a round of the forward auction, at which point the wireless carriers uh, bid, in, in, you know, bid up against one another in what, you know, what most would view as a traditional auction. Um, and and this, is, this is really an opportunity for spectrum that is perceived to be underutilized and uh, in an industry that's um, – perhaps not growing the way that uh, the wireless industry is and repurpose it to something that, uh, to an industry where uh, the demands have uh, continued to grow dramatically over, uh, over the years. Thank you very much, Greg. And Daniel, over to you. There have been a number of developments over the last uh, several months and really even the last couple of weeks. Um, why don't you tell our viewers a little bit about those latest developments? Sure, Dean. Thanks for having us. So the auction is currently at stage four in its reverse bidding phase. Uh, it is expected that for bidding and all, this would be wrapping up by the end of January. Now, I think it's, it's useful to look at what's happened since the auction started. Back then at stage one, when uh, broadcasters uh, opened it up and uh, placed their ask, um, the FCC was trying to clear 126 megahertz worth of spectrum out of which 100 megahertz were uh, usable for the uh, bidders. Um, the industry quickly realized that forward bidding was not even close uh, from what broadcasters were expecting, pretty much at $22.5 billion. A lot of noise surrounding that, that huge gap triggered a lot of comments and noise in the industry. Now, many believe that this was to be expected and uh, that what was happening was the players were simply testing the water. That actually led way to stage two. Stage two was uh, targeted to clear 114 megahertz so that um, broadcasters uh, would relinquish that spectrum and make room for 90 megahertz of usable spectrum 
for bidders or carriers. Um, stage two ended up abruptly only with one round of forward bidding, again, hitting only $21.5 billion worth of bids, very close to what happened in stage one. Now, what was reduced considerably was the asking price from broadcasters, which seemed to have been realigning or at least aligning to what seemed to be back then more realistic expectations. Um, with that, things moved on to stage three, where now the FCC was trying to clear 108 megahertz to make room for 80 megahertz of usable spectrum for uh, four bidders, carriers, or new market entrants. Um, again, the asking price dropped to $40.3 billion, uh, yet the uh, forward bidding remained at very close levels when compared to stage one and two. Uh, the number was $19.7 billion worth of, of bidding. Um, now, if you go back in time and remember what was happening back then, this was post-election time. So there was a lot of noise surrounding the, the, the auction, a lot of speculation. So people were wondering what's going to happen next, what's going to happen with this new administration. Um, again, when stage three ended up abruptly, there were, there were a lot of pessimistic views up in the air and people thinking this auction is going to be a failure. However, if you go back in time and read or, 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 or uh, go over what the FCC had stated before they started, they did design this process so that the forward auction takes place fast and uh, avoids um, broadcasters from having to wait months before they get the forward bids. Um, so we believe that this is taking place pretty much by design. The auction is working as planned in an attempt to find the as bid balance for this market. Uh, so now we're at stage four, and many believe this is the sweet spot, right? This is where uh, things are going to get real. Why? Because we're now talking about 70 megahertz of usable spectrum, which is, according to analysts, much closer to potential demand from the big players out there, namely AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile. So that, along with a dip in the clearing cost, because we're now talking about 84 megahertz as opposed to 108 megahertz, the expectation is that the asking price from broadcasters is going to be significantly less. The question is, is it going to be closer to the $20 billion mark? And are uh, carriers or forward bidders going to be uh, willing to put up that amount of money after the uh, holiday break and all the speculation that took place after the election? That's yet to be seen and uh, yet to be seen if there's going to be a stage five or not. So with that, we just have to wait and see. All right, guys, so our viewers are going to want to know some predictions here. Um, so, Greg, we'll kick this back over to you. Um, how are things going to play out, say, in the next um, six to 12 months? Yeah, I, I, God, I wish I knew the, the right answer, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I feel pretty strongly that this is still going to play out favorably. I think this round four and maybe round five are probably the critical rounds to watch. Um, we need to see some momentum. We need to see continued interest on both sides of the uh, of the auction. Um, you know, really, this is this is the environment the FCC fostered. They created this structure. Um, perhaps they didn't know all of the consequences of the the, the auction design, uh, but this, they they designed this specifically to marry supply and demand, and that's what's happening here. You've got too much supply at too high of a price right now, um, and then that needs to come in line. Price and and supply need to come in line with demand. So. Um, you know, not altogether surprised that it's gotten where it has. I think if we don't see meaningful momentum in the in this round or maybe next round, um, you know, we start having very real conversations about was this auction a, a failure? Um, you know, did, did it not achieve its stated objectives? I'd say related to this, um, you know, as, as Daniel alluded to, it happened at the same, you know, kind of in, in, in contemporaneously with the, uh, the elections. Um, you've got a new incoming administration uh, you've got uh, potentially a greater opportunity for industry consolidation in the coming in this coming term, maybe in the very short term. So uh, the the ongoing auction actually presents some interesting challenges for the industry because generally you've got you've got quiet periods that prevent any type of spectrum transactions from happening in the marketplace. Um, other than that, uh, what's what's happening in the auction? So that means a Dish Network, for example, who has uh, build constraints coming up on their spectrum and, you know, they're widely believed to be shopping their spectrum out to, to the major carriers uh, or even a Sprint and a T-Mobile who, you know, again, the speculation has surfaced again about them potentially uh, merging. Those types of things, those meaningful transactions that involve spectrum 
really are on hold until this auction plays out. So there are broader, further reaching consequences uh, to this auction not wrapping up and maybe as quickly as, uh, as, as others thought. Um, I think the other thing, you know, finally to point out is the auction is just the first step in the process. So uh, while we do still feel confident that the, the auction is going to come to a successful conclusion, uh, we, you know, we realize that there's still three plus years of work to be done after this auction uh, in order to make the, let the, let the spectrum be put to use. And, um, you know, for that reason, I think, you know, we should highlight the spectrum is not on critical path for 5G deployments. Uh, you know, we, we talk about the carriers not stepping up to the plate and, and, uh, and, you know, maybe not doing their bidding sufficient amounts to, to marry up with their demands for more spectrum being released. This spectrum is not prime spectrum for 5G. Uh, you know, the, the FCC has other initiatives underway to release uh, those, those different types of spectrum in the marketplace for the carrier. So it doesn't really hold up um, any major network evolutions in, in our estimation. Very good. Thanks, Greg. And Daniel, same question. So for those who, who believe that this is going to be successful, right, be it at stage four or five, there's still the question about the timeline that the FCC wants everybody to hit. So those 39 months that everybody's been um, presenting opinions about over the last uh, year, if not more. So the NAB has been very vocal about the fact that, uh, or about their assumption or, or belief that this is something that's not achievable because of the complexity surrounding the transition. You're repacking hundreds of stations. Uh, resources in the industry are very scarce, unlimited. Um, so the question is, what is the FCC going to do to make sure that broadcasters can hit that timeline? The FCC released a scheduling methodology trying to alleviate that, that challenge. But if you really read into it and, and understand how it works, they're going to be staggering each station and assigning it into a phase to keep everything um, ordered. Um, in doing that, they need to prevent interference between stations that are moving from one channel to another. That's going to be, we believe, the driving factor. And they also took into account into their modeling, you know, resources, timeline, weather, you name it, right? The, the constraints are many. Our question is, are those going to be, or are those going to have any meaningful impact in the scheduling when truly what we believe is going to happen is that interference is going to be dictating how these things uh, uh, happen. Now, if you look at how many resources you have out there, there's still that question to be addressed. Even though stations are going to be assigned to different phases, everyone can start and will start on day one, and everybody will be trying to reach out to the same resources at the same time. Why? Because everyone wants to be able to submit and file for the reimbursements as soon as possible. So even though the scheduling methodology that the FCC is going to be used may help, we believe it's not going to be significant in terms of alleviating that resource constraint. So. Uh, a lot to be seen. Um, we believe the timeline is aggressive and it's going to be challenging. Um, and we believe more needs to be done to make sure that the resources that are available in the industry will be enough to, to cope with this. Daniel and Greg, thank you both very, very much. It sounds to me like uh, this warrants a, uh, another interview at some point down the road. So again, thank you guys uh, for being on the show today, and thank you viewers for watching JSA TV. We'll see you soon.